it is a very great pleasure to be here. We met, I, I must congratulate you on your choice of leaders. You've done very, very well. <laughs> we, we got to know them a bit in the last couple of weeks, and uh, it's been delightful, and it, we're thrilled to be here and honored to be here. Just to give you a little bit of my, um, my criminal record, our criminal record, we um, have been married for 40 41. years. 41. 41 and in love for 45. There you go. And we have two adult boys, James and Marcus, and both of whom are married and at long last have provided us with what we are owed and entitled to called grandchildren. Um, where basically our job is to love them to bits, fill them with sugar, and hand them back. <laughs> That's really our role. And um, we have been serving the Lord together in what we call pastoral ministry for, um, uh, for pretty much 40, 40 years, oh, yeah. a bit longer than that. Um, first of all in the Church of England uh, for nearly 10 years, and then in this thing that he mentioned, the lunatic fringe of the Christian church, otherwise known as the vineyard, if you've heard of it. <laughs> and uh, we have absolutely loved the work and the, that God has called us to, and at this point we find ourselves working with the vineyard, but also making lots of friends uh, here in New York, not least these two wonderful people, so that gives you an idea. Uh when we were first married, we were ministering in the Church of England, although my background is Presbyterian, so we cover our, you know, ecumenical bases quite well. But um, when we married, we were both of us, to tell you the truth, fiercely um, mad about Jesus. We knew God was our Father. We loved all of that. Never been an issue. Believing was never that problem. And Jesus was immediate and marvelous, and we loved him to bits. But we were a little bit if I were honest, sniffy, a little bit unsure about the Holy Spirit. And so we came out of that sort of stable, didn't we, which we I did. suppose you would call technically cessationist, dispensationalist. Yeah. Right. And so we honestly did believe that the Holy Spirit had been given at the beginning of the book of Acts to give the church a real good booster, good start, set them off, and then at the end of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit withdrew again. And, you know, it's, it seems rather shocking now, but that is honestly what we bought into and what we were taught, and we were very high on the scriptures. We were real Bible people and remain so. However, um, I certainly was a bit of a henchman, and we used to work with um, school children and students and house parties and so forth. And if ever there was a little outbreak of anything naughty, I was the one, like a henchman, sent in to cut it out and to stamp on it and to stop it. Well, so like, I, a, <clears throat> like a fire extinguisher. Yes, I was. <laughs> Yes, I was. And effective. Very yeah. effective, I have to say. However... So, if there's any, <laughs> any of this prophecy or people heal, trying to heal one another or speak in tongues or anything dreadful like that? I know. <laughs> Out. However, <laughs> it also meant that I took a little nail scissors to my New Testament and I, metaphorically of course, snipped out any references to those naughty things. Prophecy, healing, tongues, demons, all of that went. Anything to do with the miraculous or the weird. Weird. And so, of course, I was left with a very filleted copy of a New Testament. I really had taken out a great deal of it in my own thinking. And then we married, didn't we? we yes, we did. And it was wonderful. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Um, having been engaged for nearly four years, don't ask that story, but it was amazing, actually. Um, there was a day when I was a little older than John, but all of that has evened out since we married 40 years ago. <laughs> You'd never know. However, um, just after we were married, having waited to be married for four years, I was struck down with meningitis. Now, I was now in my early 30s, and that's not a joke. I mean, that was a really serious illness. And uh, we were working in our first curacy, as it's called, in the Church of England. So John was the curate, which he always said was the lowest form of ecclesiastical life. I was the curate's wife, which was a tiny bit lower. So we were in this parish working as Anglican clergy, and I was newly married and struck down with meningitis. Now, the thing about the parish we worked in was that it was led by the most amazing people with whom we went to work, and we loved them dearly, but they were all charismatics. So they all believed in the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which was awkward, 
But John and I, in our youthful arrogance, honestly thought that God might use us to stamp it all out. <laughs> Imagine the arrogance. I mean, it was outrageous. But God had another way of catching our attention. He struck me down or allowed me to be struck down with meningitis. And I went off to hospital and on a Saturday and the next morning... No, and on the Saturday you um, went off in this ambulance, you know, covered in sort of shrouds because they were rather worried about it. And then um, you recovered and clearly. didn't you? Well, yeah. I mean, you, you came out of hospital. You yes. survived, clearly survived. Yes, yes. And then... Um, <laughs> but then Some you had argue. a long period of convalescence. Yeah, yeah. And technically you were better. I mean, technically the virus had gone. And I could stand on my feet. You could just. Yeah. But cracking headaches and exhaustion. So one morning, we called yeah. to church one Sunday night, and the next, the, the vicar said to me, my dear Eleanor, um, I, uh, you're yeah. not at all well, are you? Which was not good news, of course. It was blindingly obvious. And I thought, well, if that's the gift of discernment, my friend, I could have told you that. That's <laughs> not impressive. And then he said, well, would you like to come to the staff meeting tomorrow? And, I, and we'd love to pray for you. And I knew what would happen, because the staff meeting was all, the, obviously, the staff. They were all friendly and sweet and smiley on a Monday morning. And I knew they would sit me down in the middle of the room, just in a circle, all of them around me. And then, at a certain point, they would all converge and lay their sticky hands upon my person, <laughs> invading my personal space, which I hated. And then, above all, they would obviously start praying in tongues, which was anathema. Sounded to me like everybody knitting at the same time. So, it turned out that I was more prophetically gifted than I knew because everything I suspected came true. They were all very friendly. They sat me in the middle of the room. They converged upon me like it's a rugby scrum, we would say in our country. Um, you play something else, but this is the real thing, rugby. That's just saying. And then they laid their hands on me, as I feared, and they all prayed in tongues very vociferously and enthusiastically, and I was instantaneously healed of severe meningitis, never had a headache to that day or this. Now that was, a, I mean, it was wonderful. It was changed my life. I mean, it made me better, but it also left me with a problem because suddenly the Holy Spirit had had mercy on me. The rule and the reign of Jesus had broken in. The king and the kingdom had come into our world in a more dramatic way than we could ever have imagined. And from that day to this, we said, well, this, if what we've just experienced is true, this is the way to carry on from now until glory, which is what we are trying to do. Do you want to carry on? Let me let you go on. All right. Is that good? Oh. I'm oh. leaving you now. No, we, I, we don't vote. No. <laughs> who would you like to continue? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> because I might just lose that particular <laughs> clever site. I shall be back. <laughs> no, darling, no, 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 come, no, no, hang on. Fast forward. All right. Fast forward several years. No, you'd enjoy, this, this has been interesting. Fast forward several years, and we had shifted, obviously, in our understanding that, um, our, that God does do these things today. Not every time, but and we had enough evidence of the sort of healing that Eleanor experienced, and we'd seen, begun to see in other people, but it never occurred to us that, honestly, it never occurred to us that God would ever use us, her or me, to heal somebody or to prophesy or, or you know, some of the, these things you see in the New Testament. Yeah, evangelize, yes. Teach the scriptures, yes. But not, none of the others. Funny stuff. And then, um, I, I, and for me, but no, I don't think for Ellen, but for me, I always thought I was not holy enough, pure enough. I didn't think I'd read my Bible enough. I didn't think I'd prayed enough. I didn't think I was spiritual enough. You know, it was all that sort of stuff. So I rather discounted myself. And then um, the, 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 vi the vineyard was started by a Southern Californian by the name of John Wimber. Tell him about that. Go, go on, tell him this. Yeah, yeah. Taking your time. Yeah, so, go, go for it. John Wimber was the man that God chose to use to start the vineyard movement in California about 40 years ago. And John had been out to California and met him and seen the church, but I hadn't because our little one was very tiny. So you came home transformed. I mean, 
hugely, hugely affected by having seen the purest and most beautiful of worship as we had this morning. And indeed, the whole way that they did small groups and the whole way that they prayed for one another, like falling off a log, it was so natural. And then Wimber came, but I was very skeptical. Wimber came to town. We were working in a parish by then in the center of London, just behind Buckingham Palace. And so we took some of our people to the meeting at Holy Trinity Brompton, which is a church where the Alpha Course emanated from and full of friends of ours. And so we took our people and we sat at the back because of my skepticism. And during the course of the evening, John Wimber arrived, looking, I have to say, ridiculous, in a Hawaii, you know, Hawaiian shirts in church, please, Reeboks, which were awful, and chewing gum, which was, in our standards, a banned substance in our home. We'd, nobody was allowed, much like cannabis would have been. So, <laughs> honestly, I'm really serious. We did not do that stuff. And so when Wimber came in wearing really rather awful clothes, massively overweight, Reeboks, chewing gum, I was not best pleased or impressed. However, he came to the evening meeting and he started to teach from the scriptures, which reassured me. And then the interesting thing was he put his Bible down and he started walking up and down the stage just like this. And he said, now, let's just wait for the Lord. We're just going to listen to the Lord. And, he's, and then he started to read off, as it were, from medical notes, things that were happening to people in that room at that moment. I mean, it was riveting. And then it was as if he were reading those x-ray plates that they put up in, you know, sort of um, programs. Hospitals. Watch. Hospitals, yeah, and television programs. So, I, I mean, it was somebody with the fourth lumbar vertebra, somebody who'd been to a doctor on Thursday, the doctor had said this, someone who was doing that. that. I mean, it really was extraordinary. How would you know that? And then he would have people indicate whether it applied to them, and it did. And then he came up with a new one. He said, there's, somebody, there's one or two people here suffering from athlete's foot. Do you know that thing? It's horrid, beastly, sort of fungal on the feet. And I remember thinking, so, so what? If you do, I don't want to know, and keep your socks on. Don't tell me anything. <laughs> so that was not impressive. And then, worst of all, he said, and there are women in this room this evening. It was packed. And they're struggling with a certain gynecological complaint. And we would love to pray for you because I think God would love to heal you of that. Now, that really tore it for me. I thought, this is not good. He's crossed a line. He's an American in an English church. He's badly dressed. He's talking about gynecology in a mixed circle of people. <laughs> Who does he think he is? What is going on here? Can I tell them about my mother? Yes. My mother? Yes. <laughs> this, will, this, will just, this will just give you a bit of context uh, for, regarding Eleanor's background and her approach to... Things gynecological, Pers yes. Personal things. My mother, who was a, a wonderful woman, large, large frontage, um, but very sort of buttoned up, and she said, uh, when I was just to marry John at age 31, she said, my darling, we need to have a little word. Said, oh, no. I know what's coming. This had been 31 years in the waiting. And she said... Um, this was her sex talk. extensive sex education. It was. It was. She said, she took in her breath. She was obviously frightfully embarrassed. Puffed out her large chest. And she said, my darling, I have had two babies. I don't know how. Don't ask me anything. That was it. That was honestly my preparation for marriage. So for an American to come into our church and start to talk about these things, you can see why it was a huge culture offense to me. But even more offensive was the fact that it was a condition with which I was currently struggling. <laughs> so of course, you can chuckle. So of course, <laughs> what could I do? So he said, now I brought a team of people with me and they're trained to pray for people, which is interesting. Just stop for a minute. We can be trained, like Jesus trained the disciples to do this stuff, which is what we'll talk more about this evening. So he said, you can be trained. And um, these fellows, are, girls and, and, and men out the back, will be very helpful and sensitive to you. So I went out the back. And, you know, if I were to hobble, it would be obviously athlete's foot. So I hobbled <laughs> at the back. And, <laughs> you know, a woman has her pride. And... Uh, <laughs> and I was met, I thought there's bound to be a midwife on the team or a middle-aged comfortable woman. But no, I was met by a very small Californian wearing a sleeveless shirt and more hairy than any man since Esau. He was just horrid. If I see him in heaven, I'll, I'll spot him at 100 yards. He just had tufts of hair wherever you can imagine it would be. 
and sleeveless and, and everything. It was just such an offense to me. And he said to me, what can I do for you, honey? Well, nobody calls me honey. So I explained, it like, blah, 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 I can't remember. And he just prayed for me and actually fair play, he was very sweet. And then he did this. Go and pray for the sick. It was shocking. So I went back and I sat in the back, but by then the Holy Spirit had come and he was upon me. I knew he was. I was hot. My heart was thudding. And all I wanted was to get to the front with Wimber. And I said to John, John, I've got to go to the front. I've got to be with that man. And you, God bless you to this day, recognized what was going on, took me up to John, said, John, this is my wife, Eleanor. You met her this morning. Will you take her with you and will you teach her all you know? And for two hours, that man taught me how to watch for the Holy Spirit. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing, and to pray for the sick. And it was life-changing. And then he got tired. He was jet-lagged. He zipped up his rather dreadful little bomber jacket. And he went off down the avenue at Holy Trinity Brompton. And I ran after him. I said, John, that thing that happened, those words that you saw, I want to do that. And he was slightly exasperated and tired. He just turned around and said, receive it. <laughs> just like that. So I came away from a meeting where I had had my gynecology discussed in open. I had had my hand slapped by a very hairy Californian. And I had my head hit by the preacher at the front. And I have to say that in amongst the offense, it was life-changing. And I would never have changed anything of it. Is that what you meant? Thank you. Now can I go? <laughs> um, if you've got a Bible, t will you turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1. First Corinthians, chapter 1. Um, Eleanor has stolen a large portion of my time, so we're going to have to move very fast. But if this doesn't make sense, you know who to blame. Um, and you're going to, I want to talk about what Christianity looks like. And we'll start at chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 18. For Paul writes to the church in Corinth, in Greece, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. And then he asked rhetorically, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom didn't know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Let me just, let's just hit for a second hit the pause button. It may just be a little bit helpful to have some of the context. In the city of Corinth, to which Paul was writing, very much like the Western world, very much like New York, very much like London, um, two things were highly valued in those culture, in their culture too. Wisdom and power. And the, op the opposites, if those two things were valued, the opposites were despised. So, Foolishness was despised. They were contemptuous on people who were, in their view, stupid. Also, weakness was despised. And in the ancient world, you know, as you, as you know very well, women who were perceived as weak were despised and badly treated. Slaves were despised. People with disabilities were despised and treated badly. Do you see? So this was going on in the culture. And some people in the church in Corinth were beginning to say, when Paul came to Corinth to, first of all, preach the gospel, the way he preached and the sort of Christianity he projected, 
he got, the way he did it was wrong. He should have put much more emphasis on Christianity producing powerful people and wise people, because that'll fit in with the culture. Do you see? So Paul hears about this, and then he writes them a letter to say, no, 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 no. The way I preached the gospel when I came to you was exactly the way it should be. So let me tell you. So that's why you'll see this, the way he plays with these ideas of weakness, uh, um, wisdom and foolishness, and power and weakness. Make sense? Let's have another round of it. Uh, let's pick it up here, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, there you go, thank you. The world through its wisdom didn't know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Verse 22. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. Jews, Jews find themselves saying, prove it, prove it. No, no, sorry. Jews find themselves wanting miraculous signs, saying, show me. Okay, if this God is real, show me. I want a sign. Greeks, on the other hand, are looking for wisdom. So the Greeks are saying, with this, this God exists. P prove it. Do, do, do you see? Now, I don't know about you, but as you've talked with people who are not believers in Jesus, haven't you heard exactly the same thing being said? Show me or prove it or both. Nothing changes. But, he goes on, but we preach Christ. And he's about to put his pen down, and he, he adds, no, the, let me tell you about the Christ I'm talking about, the crucified, weak, devastated, tortured, broken Christ. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but those whom God has called, both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. He goes on, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. In other words, just think back to when you first met Jesus for yourself. When you, in that sense, you were called by God. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the things that just despise, so that no one may boast before him. And then on just to click on to, when I came to you, this is, um, he's referring to his visit to Corinth. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ. And of course, by that I mean him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. This is the apostle talking. And I came to you weak. And my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. In other words, I didn't play the game that, that your Corinthian philosophers and you know, use fancy words and sharp logic and all this sort of stuff. I, that's, I didn't take that approach at all, he says. But I came rather with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power so that your faith might rest not on men's, men and women's wisdom, mankind's wisdom, but on as he says there, God's power. Hmm? So, what, let me suggest to you that Paul is saying two things. He's, he, he's addressing what Christianity looks like. And to many people outside, many people who are not believers, Christianity seems to present, first of all, a weak, foolish message. A weak, foolish message. Look in verse 18 again. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are preaching. When you say, you say to me, John, why, why, why does Paul describe it as foolishness? And the answer is because the idea that you can find out the truth about God 
at the crucifixion of Jesus, frankly, is absurd. In other words, what Christianity has always said is God loves to reveal himself to people. And he's done it all the way through history with the creation and then with the people of Israel to reveal how he, what he's like. And then with, he sent the prophets to reveal himself and to reveal more himself. And then, ultimately, supremely, he sent Jesus. And, if you, and he said, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. And if you want to look at God in Jesus most clearly, then what you need to do is to go to a small city in Jerusalem called, in Israel called Jerusalem, go to a hill just on the outskirts of the city, beyond the city wall. And that particular hill has a dual function. It's the city's rubbish, garbage dump, and it's also the city's execution uh, venue. It has dual functions. And on this particular occasion, there are three men being executed simultaneously. The two on either side are crooks, criminals. The one in the middle is the one to watch. Because he is God, God's son, being crucified. And what the Bible says is the love of God and the magnificence of God is most brilliantly revealed in that moment. So the idea that the God of heaven would reveal himself at the bloody, messy scene of torture and execution. I mean, just think about it for a moment. The screams, the blood, the stench, the flies, the cursing, the blasphemy. I mean, you can, you can begin, you know, we can begin to imagine it. That's where God is revealing himself. People just say, that's ridiculous. That's utterly ridiculous. And to the Corinthians, as to the citizens of New York City today, the cross was utter nonsense. It was a flat contradiction. I mean, it was like talking about boiled ice. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't compute. And then look at verse, but then, but now look at verse 24. Paul says, this is what it appears, and then he says at the beginning of verse 24, but, 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 to those whom God hath called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In other words, he's saying God's wisdom and God's power are condensed, are, are encapsulated, are made tangible in the crucifixion of Jesus. I mean, it's extraordinary. And, and would be ridiculous were it not true. In Christ, God has overpowered and outsmarted everyone. How did he do it? With his lavish and recklessly generous grace and forgiveness poured out because he went there in your place. and You and I should have gone there God sent his son instead. Do you see, to outsiders, it's a weak, foolish message. But to those of us who have understood it and grasped it and to whom God has revealed it, it's just magnificent. So first of all, a weak, foolish message. Second point, a weak, foolish messengers. Not only is the message to the outsider, the message appears to be weak and foolish. So do the messengers. Do you see, it's a bit like to the outsider, it's a bit like, um, I think um, Seth mentioned that we live in the center of, right in the, now we live right in the center of London, right in the middle. And if you've ever been there and visited London, you may have, you've probably gone to Parliament and Big Ben, you know, the clock, and you may have gone to Buckingham Palace to have a look at that, and look at the soldiers, you know, in their uniform. And you may also have gone to a place called Westminster Abbey, which is the building, the, the ancient church, where all the kings and queen, queens have been 
uh, the, the coronation has taken place. And if you go in the main front door, it's called the Great West Door, as you approach it, you probably didn't notice, but up above you, there's a, lot, a huge, what's called a rose window, a huge um, stained glass window. But from the outside, it looks pretty boring and gray and drab, and you know, it doesn't really... But you go into the front door, go in the Great West Door, walk a few yards up towards the altar, and then look, turn around and look back at the rose window, and you, you'll, be, you'll say, me, oh my, that is stunning, because it is. It's absolutely stunning. You see, from, my point is that from the outside, it looks boring and you just you know, wouldn't take any notice of it. But my goodness, from the inside. And it's a little bit like that with Christianity. From the outside, people say, well, why, why would you waste your time with that? Oh, but once, you're, once you've met Jesus for yourself, it totally changes. So it's not only that to the outsider, Christianity has weak, foolish message. It has weak, foolish messengers. Look at verse 26. The world has never been impressed by the, the message of Jesus. It's never been impressed by the messengers. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. In Greek society, wise by human standards was all important. And, and what Paul is saying is not many of you were that, like that. Now, there may be a few people here who are... You know, you have PhDs in logic or philosophy or whatever, and wonderful, you're, you're so welcome. And nobody's criticizing, we're just saying that there aren't many of us here like that. There aren't many who are influential. I mean, the, the mayor of New York, I doubt whether he's sitting here, but if he were, he'd be very, very welcome, or city councilors, whatever. Do you see? So, but I'd, statistically, there probably aren't very many movers and shakers in the city of New York, sitting in this room right now. Not many of you were of noble birth. I doubt whether, statistically, there are a huge number of aristocracy sitting here. <laughs> Do you know? And, but again, if you are, you're very, very welcome, and it's not your fault. It was... A, it was <laughs> you know? But, but not many of us have blue blood running in us. Yeah. But you see, yet again, how does Paul respond to that? Look at the beginning of verse 27. All this was true, but. Do you notice that? But. In contrast to that, God chose. Three times it comes in verses 27 and 28. God chose the foolish things. Next, God chose the weak things. Just in case you didn't get it, you were asleep the first time and only half awake the second time. The third time he says, he chose. You see, the point he's driving home is the, the, fact that you're, the very fact you're sitting here in this room right now is no accident. It's no... It's not the result of some random collection of molecules and atoms colliding in such a way that by pure fluke or just by chance this has happened to you. No, no, no. He's saying God chose. And he's saying specifically to you, God chose you. You know, he surveyed everybody else and he chose, I'll have you, he said, and you, and you, and you, and you. Yeah, you, yeah, you, mm. And you, and you, and even the person in the back who's fast asleep, God chose. It's stunning. Our immediate reaction is, me? Me? Why me? Very, very good question. None of us deserved it, and none of us know why God chose us. That's not the point. The point is that God did choose. He chose you. He picked you out deliberately because he loves you and values you and chose you. Why didn't he pick the others? That's for him. If you ever discover the answer to that question, you better write a book very quickly because you'll make an absolute fortune because that's one of the things we simply don't know. But what we don't know doesn't um, demolish what we do know. And what God does says that he chose you. It's just, yeah, I mean, it's bewildering. It's stunning. But you see, um, 
something. <laughs> this is, uh, maybe a hundred years after the, just a mere hundred years after Jesus had been crucified, resurrected, and then ascended. Not much more than a hundred years. A man called, after that, a man called Celsus wrote this, highly, highly critical of Christians. He says, let no cultivated person draw near Christianity. None wise, none sensible. I mean, if you're, if you're stupid, you know, come on, you're welcome. You know, Christianity is for idiots, basically is what he's saying. If anyone is ignorant, if anyone is a fool, oh, let him come boldly. Of Christians, he gets a little carried away. He says, of Christians, we see them in their own houses, those most uneducated and vulgar persons. They are like a swarm of bats or ants creeping out of their nests, or, this gets weird, or frogs holding a symposium in a swamp, or a collection of worms in a lump of, uh, we better call it mud. But that's not what it says. Christians have never been popular. Yet again, Paul says, but God chose. God chose. Your former president, it's President's Day tomorrow, isn't it? So we celebrate Abraham Lincoln, among other people, who famously said, God must love common people because he made so many of them. <laughs> You see, God says, I'm going to choose ordinary people. And I'm going to make them extraordinary. I'm going to take nobodies, at least in the sight of the world, people who are nobodies. And I'm going to make them into somebodies. That's the message of Christianity. So if you ask the question, who from God's perspective, or through, through, as it were, through God's lenses, from the way that God looks at things, who are the, in reality, are the powerful people and the wise people on earth today? Who are the movers and shakers? Who are the true aristocrats? You get the astonishing answer. But it is the church. It is the local church. It's you lot here at Wellspring. And Paul, as if to drive the point home, Paul says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. In other words, I was weak as everybody else is weak. And you say, you what? Yeah, Paul, it's not an image we have of Paul, is it? Came f fearful and, and, and nervous and trembling. But that was Paul. So if you've ever, if God has ever said to you or indicated to you, I want you to go and serve me and do that, I want you to go and give this homeless person some food or to go and speak to this person about Jesus or you're in the office and talk to a colleague and do some kind act for a colleague who's somewhat hostile. And you think, oh, no, I'm not sure I want to do that. I'm a bit, I feel a bit f f nervous, a bit trembly. You are in very, very good company because that's exactly how Paul is. And in fact, you see, what Paul is saying in, in this whole chapter, what he's actually saying is, look, contrary to what you may your culture may think in Corinth. Let me tell you what happened. I came to Corinth weak, and God worked. In other words, he's implying that the, the very thing that you and I think disqualifies us, our weakness, is the very thing Paul is saying that qualifies us. So, very, very simple, very straightforward. Number one, if you, want to be a, a, if you want God to use you and to be a servant of God and be at his disposal, there are th really only, it's very simple, you just need three things. Number one, you need to love Jesus. Yep. 
Well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't do that. Number two, that you've got to be alive rather than dead. So if you've got a, just check you've got a pulse, then I can assure you you're alive. You've got to be, you've got to love Jesus. You've got to be alive. And thirdly, you've got to be weak. You've got, I say that deliberately, you've got to be weak. It doesn't work. It disqualifies you if you think you're strong and you've got this thing you know, mastered. It doesn't work like that. It's our weakness, Paul says, that qualifies us. Hmm? Nod politely. <laughs> Grunt approvingly. There you go. Uh, why didn't you stand up and we'll pray together? Lord, we thank you for this wonderful sound of yours, Paul. We thank you that some of his stuff was, his letters were preserved and have been uh, incorporated into our Bible because we believe, Lord, that behind his words was your word. And the same Holy Spirit who wrote these words speaks to us today. And Lord, we happily, gladly tell you that we are weak and sometimes foolish, but we thank you that you have chosen us. We can never thank you enough, but we'll try. <laughs> to say thank you, you have chosen us. And just like you used your servant Paul, will you use us, your 21st century servants? We ask you to pour your Holy Spirit upon us right now, this very minute. The Spirit of God, as you know, has been with us all morning. That's wonderful, such a blessing. And we're, so we're simply asking for more, which is a very biblical prayer. There's a famous preacher, a man called D.L. Moody, who came from Chicago. And he woman once said to him, Mr. Moody, have you been filled with the Spirit? He said, yes, but I leak. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true of many of us. And we need to be filled. The Bible says be filled and go on. It implies go on being filled up. So that's all we're doing this morning. Saying, will you now? We're just saying, Lord, will you please fill us with your Holy Spirit again now? Come, Holy Spirit.